So the following interview was conducted with John and Ann Pickett for the Purdue University Libraries. It took place on July 20th, 2015 at their home. The interviewer is Renee Corder. So um, I have a few questions here, but we're, we'll just chat for an hour and, okay. and just get to right. know. We don't have to stick to the, the questions if we don't want to. Um, so I know that you both were students at Purdue mm -hmm. and Annie worked for Purdue. Right. Um, so when did each of you first come to Purdue and what brought you here? Well, I came in 1960, as did Ann. Uh, and I came here only to study diseases of poultry. But it expanded <laughs> from that point. It kind of got away from me a little bit. Uh, I came to Purdue also in 1960, and I didn't know what I was going to study, but um, I knew I didn't want to be a teacher, <laughs> so I was looking for another option um, and ended up in um, uh, what was then called ho home economics and um, in dietetics and nutrition. And, and John, what was your major? Uh, my undergraduate major was uh, in... Uh, animal science. I was in the poultry option. I was the only student <laughs> in that wow. option. And so I had one-on-one -on -one with professors uh, in those courses that related to that. And uh, then I was out of school for a year, uh, came back, got a DVM in uh, 1969, graduated first in 1964. And uh, then uh, <laughs> went into small animal practice. Uh, between uh, 1978 and 1980, I returned to graduate school. I continued in practice, but returned to graduate school part-time uh, in uh, poultry diseases. And uh, But I continued my... Uh, uh, career in, in practice until, in small animal practice, until uh, 2009. Wow. So are you both from Indiana then? Why, why did you choose Purdue? Yes. Uh, my father went to Purdue and um, yes, I'm from, grew up in Logansport and um, never considered any other school. <laughs> <laughs> IU was never on the horizon. Not. <laughs> no. and I'm from Sheridan. Uh, my family had some uh, farms with cattle and hogs and grain, as well as my uh, family was in a poultry and egg business, and that's why I was so interested in poultry. Birds in general, really. Now, is your practice still running? Was it in West Lafayette? Uh, yes, my practice, the practice I was in, started in 1949 uh, by a, a fellow by the name of Russell Portman, who was an Ohio State graduate, and I worked for him part-time when I was a student, <clears throat> and he had an opening just as I graduated and thought it might be a good idea to make a living, <laughs> and so I took the job with him. Um, and then I retired, and then I became his partner. He retired. We took in other people. Uh, in uh, 2003, we sold our practice to uh, Veterinary Centers of America, and that still exists on 26 across from Caterpillar. That's, that's where we take our And Who is it? Um, uh, I still work an occasional day once in a while, uh, but uh, not there for other veterinarians. But uh, that's that's about the extent of that. That's like I said to Anne. That's where we take our dog. Is that PCA? <laughs> um, yeah. So I know that you both lived in the residence halls while students. Can you tell me about about that? Each one of you. I lived in X Hall. Okay. <laughs> um, I lived in Southwest for three years and Southeast for one year. 
and um, all four years in, in X Hall. Of course, it's called Meredith mm -hmm. now, but <laughs> it was X then. <laughs> and you lived in Cary, correct? Uh, well, I lived my first year in what's called H2. I don't know, I think it's McCutcheon now? No, Tarkington. Tarkington, thank you. And uh, <coughs> I moved to Cary to be the roommate of a friend of mine. Uh, and um, from there I, I got involved in student politics. I was a, what they called a corridor representative or something of that nature. And uh, then I became uh, president of the unit, West unit, and the next year president of Cary. Uh, and and you were the president of your hall, correct? Yes, it was governor? called governor. Okay. Yeah. Um, my freshman year, I was a corridor representative. Um, sophomore year, I was what we, what we called a counselor. Um, and the only pay on that was when you worked on the desk. And then I think it was about 65 cents an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and um, then my junior year, I was social coordinator of the hall. And my senior year, I was governor. So it, it was, counselors were a little different then, um, but there probably weren't as many problems either. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, now, did you both meet because of the residence halls? Can you tell me how you met? Yes, well, <laughs> yes and no. We were, we were in Tomahawk. We were both in, okay. um, in Tomahawk Honorary. Um, we actually met um, or started dating because of a, we were working together on a committee, um, and it was a fundraising committee called The Ugliest Man on Campus. Oh. <laughs> and the, our, we would go around from hall to hall doing skits, trying to get votes, and the vote was done by, with pennies. Um, and the, our candidate was the then president of Cary Hall. Um, Alan Curtis. Alan Curtis, yes. and. Uh, so anyway, we were working on that committee together. And then uh, one of my friends um, was coming to town. Her mother was coming to town, and her name was Carol Pasquale. And her mother was the best Italian cook I ever <laughs> And she was bringing spaghetti and spaghetti sauce, and <laughs> um, I needed a date. And so we were working together, and so I just invited him to to uh, come and have spaghetti. <laughs> Turned out to be one of my favorite meals. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's how we started. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit about some of your responsibilities as the president of Cary? Well, as a president of Cary, you're also on the uh, student senate. Um, what? <laughs> One of the major responsibilities of the president of Cary was to see that the president of the student body was a uh, was not from the fraternity system, and <laughs> and we worked uh, long and hard at uh, getting out the vote for that. And uh, I wouldn't say we were bribe free. <laughs> we bribed them. Uh, our, Actually, we didn't bribe them. Uh, yes, we did. Uh, if you voted, you got free ice cream, and so uh, that was that was about the extent of it. And uh, Kerry had a very very high percentage of voting, and uh, for fifteen hundred people, it it made a difference, and it always worked. <laughs> Now, why did you not want someone from the Greek system in the presidency? Because we lived in the residence halls. <laughs> that, that's the only reason. Now, we had friends, of course, who were in the Greek system, um, socialized with them, uh, involved in classes and other school things with them. Um, but... Uh, uh, it was just a long-standing tradition. I don't know how far back it went, 
but uh, it lasted the four years that uh, we were students there. Uh, in the 60s, a lot of things began to change and fall apart. Uh, people became more independent uh, in the sense that nobody really wanted to be told what to do. And uh, Purdue had very little of the 60s upheaval that some universities experienced. And I think it was primarily because they were uh, a science oriented school and uh, the people there were not I mean they weren't into political science or being lawyers or, or people who or you know liberal arts I'm, I'm not knocking liberal arts or liberal arts people but science people see the world a little different than liberal arts people see the world and so I, though there was some uh, of that, there was very little. Uh, but people were becoming more independent thinking, so to speak. Uh, women, for example, always had to wear skirts. They were never allowed to wear slacks, mm -hmm. except if it was sub-zero for days on end never allowed to wear slacks in the Memorial Union. I have heard that, yes. Yeah. And you did not walk on the grass. Now it's <laughs> cut across as quickly as you can get there. All the people hang hammocks and yeah. play in the grass. Yeah, right. Now, you referenced the ice cream. I've heard that there's a story with, with the ice cream involving <laughs> tickets. Well, and yes, that was... That was a, a kind of a little interesting event. It, I, I likened it to the idea that I can create a program that you can't hack. Oh yes, I've hacked your program. Well, I fixed that, I patched it. Well, I hacked it again. And it goes back and forth, back and forth, cat and mouse kind of thing. Well, um, the students complained because when you got your dinner, if you got a bowl of ice cream with it, by the time you finished your dinner, your ice cream was just juice. Mm -hmm. It was just milk, you know, cream. And so the students talked with the uh, uh, food service people and they said, well, why don't we do this? Why don't we just give you a bowl when you come through and when your dinner is finished, come back, the server will give you the ice cream. And so what we would do was we would uh, send somebody from the table with a tray of dishes and he would get the ice cream, bring it back. It avoided congestion, really, was what happened. And uh, usually you could pick on freshmen to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And so... <laughs> uh, then, after a while, students realized they could take a napkin, clean that bowl, send a different person back with a tray, bring more ice cream. <laughs> and so the food service realized that their ice cream uh, servings were greater than the number of people eating. And so then they went on a program whereby you got a ticket when you went through the door checker. He gave you a ticket, and you could take those tickets back and get the bowls of ice cream. Well, it didn't take long for kids to go over to Milner's where they bought the tickets and buy rolls of tickets, orange, green, blue, whatever. And so <coughs> they somebody would say, tonight's color is orange, and so they're reeling off the orange tickets so then they had to buy the double tickets so that your numbers were somewhere in the range of the tickets that they had distributed. Well, at that point I graduated, so I don't know what the next thing was, but now they have self-serve. Yeah. 
all you want to eat. It's a little station. You can make a waffle, put ice cream on top if you want. Yeah. yeah. Right. Anything you want. Right. So that, I mean, that was, uh, it, was a, it was a matter of, I'm smarter than you are. <laughs> no, you're not. Yes, I am, et cetera. <laughs> Back and forth, they had. Uh, it was it was a kind of a fun thing in a way for the students. Probably wasn't for the administration. <laughs> for the uh, messed up their ordering system. Yeah, it messed up their ordering. <laughs> Run out of ice cream, I guess. Now, Anne, you were the governor. What? How? How was it like being the governor? What were some of your responsibilities? Um. Well, I I think it's. Um, more or less just um, um, being involved with the administration also was on the student senate um, but um, um, whatever activities were involved in the hall we would be involved in that um, um, it was a, just a leadership role and uh, um, it was fairly time consuming um, but um, but it was always interesting, you know. Um, I don't know. I don't know that I remember exactly what what the responsibilities yeah. were, and they were not. They were they were just student activity oriented, you know, activities. Did you have any ice cream capers or anything? No, you but you know, at that time they were waiter served meals, and so you all came into the dining room at approximately the same time. You you only came in your dining room. Um, so there were four dining rooms in, in X Hall. Um, you only ate in your dining room. You stood in line and, and when you went in, you ate at the table wherever you were in line. You didn't, um, you didn't have any choice of what the next table was. The tables were set um, and then your plate was served by the waiter by waiters and they were the same waiters every night in the hall so you got to know um, there was a head waiter and um, usually three others um, so there were four waiters in each hall and usually the salad was already on the table and um, and maybe the dessert depending on what it was um, at lunchtime of course it was cafeteria style but you had only one hour um, you had to eat during that one hour period. Um, I remember you had, you could only have one glass of milk and there was a milk machine. You put your glass in and you pushed a button, um, but it was always, they always had to station somebody at there at the beginning of the year because if you push the button twice, you got two glasses oh. in one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you could only push that button once. Um, and you had very limited choices. You might have a choice of two things at, at noon. Um, at dinner, um, you didn't have choices other than fish and pork night, you might have a choice. Um, but meals were served, and um, and I don't remember remember many complaints about it. it. That was the way it was, you know, we didn't. That's how it was at home, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, and. Uh, it was it was really pretty good food. Um, we've the residence halls have never skimped. I don't think on a qu food quality ever, and so um, you know it might not have been your favorite dish, but it was good. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, um, we had to we had to dress for dinner. Like he said, we'd never we were not allowed to wear slacks, um, and on. Um, Wednesdays and Sundays, you had to wear hose and heels. So um, you were dressed. When, you know, blue jeans were not something you wore unless you were going on a hayride. Mm -hmm. That was it. <laughs> you know. um, but well, now you see students in their the, gym wear all the time. Well, the, yes, the men had to wear a tie every night to dinner, and on Wednesdays and Sundays, you had to wear a sport coat or a suit coat. Uh, it's the same, same kind of deal, mm -hmm. except the meals were never served. You just um, went through the line, uh, and um, following the meals, uh, 
usually you had coffee and uh, there was smoking was allowed in the dining rooms at that time. In fact, some of the cigarette companies used to pass out cigarettes. Oh, really? Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, uh, they'd give you a little box with three cigarettes in it. Four. Uh, four? <laughs> <laughs> well, at any rate... They were always either Winston or Salem. Yeah, <laughs> and then, of course, you played the uh, usual table games. Uh, Kerry Hall had hoop. They were like wagon wheels with mm -hmm. lights on them. I don't know if they still have them or not, but uh, they had what we called etiquette basketball. You'd take a uh, napkin, dip it in the water, and make it into a ball, shoot it up through that, and try to hit the glass of water <laughs> at the bottom, and uh, slide the salt shakers across the table and see how close to the edge you could get them. And uh, some people did things like take a, a plate and a glass of water, yeah. turn it upside down. Of course, the waiters hated that, yeah. but uh, there were those kind of activities that, that went on. One of the things that I remember, one of the things that Hall presidents were responsible for was the freshman orientation. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Basically, it was pretty much an orientation to your hall. It wasn't an orientation to the university, right. per se. Uh, when I got there, and I guess through most of the time I was there, maybe all, <coughs> uh, freshmen wore uh, little green beanies. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, that didn't last very long. I mean, they didn't wear them very long. But the upperclassmen would always berate somebody they knew who was a freshman who wasn't wearing his beanie. And uh, the seniors wore derbies, had senior cords and carried canes, and grew beards. Uh, I'm sh sure the women had similar, uh, similar activities, but I, don't, I have no idea what they were. <laughs> Do you remember what they were? Yes, we were, we also had beanies. There were the halls um, each had a symbol on it that mm -hmm. were, you know represented right. their hall on the beanies. Of course, most freshmen took them off as soon as they got on campus. But <laughs> but the kind of the advantage was when when they had on a beanie, you could ask anybody how to get to a building, and they didn't <laughs> question why you didn't know. <laughs> so um, for the first few days, it was not. Not disgraceful, mm -hmm. um, but yes, we did do orientation things, and you know, part of it involved um, orienting the campus and taking tours of campus. And um, of course, the campus wasn't nearly as big; <laughs> um, there weren't as many, <coughs> many places. And most students lived in the residence halls because there really weren't very many apartments, um, and the apartments that there were were mostly occupied by. Um, what we called hippies, <laughs> you know, they yeah, were yeah. Um, n usually not freshmen, um, but usually um, around the fringe areas of the campus there were old houses like there are now um, that were apartments, but um, uh, I never knew anybody that lived off campus. They, everybody lived on campus. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It was never required. It's never been required as far as I know. That the, yeah, that, I have heard. I've um, interviewed a few administrators, and it's never been a, a requirement. Right. Yeah. And, and that, you know, there were, of course, people who commuted, um, but a lot of times um, people who commuted from the communities around um, had friends in the residence halls and would come in the residence halls and, and um, stay. W one of the things is that we had, we had hours. Um, <laughs> And you had to be in. I mean, you just didn't break that rule because um, it just wasn't acceptable. Um, and living in the halls were um, head residents who had an apartment on the first floor, um, and that was usually an older woman. Um, they were always friendly, and um, they they were not. Um, they might report things, but they were not in charge of discipline. They were to be 
a house mother type person. Yeah. And um, uh, one of the things that, that the governing board, the um, student governing board was involved in was um, discipline for what, you know, um, they would decide what the discipline was. Um, uh, but there were also there was also a manager of each hall who frequently lived in. Um, I, I think I, I think maybe always lived in. Occasionally it would be a couple, and there was an apartment where they would um, live there. Um, and then uh, women's halls and men's halls were separate separately managed. Um, the director of the women's halls was Betty Armsman. Mm -hmm. And the uh, um, food director um, was Maxine Wilson, and um, each hall then had a food manager, as they do now, and um, ordering soup, similar to what um, they did until we went to the dining courts. Um, but um, you know the um, the discipline problems were a little different. We didn't have, there were not drugs in the halls, ever. Um, I never heard of it. Um, people knew better than to bring alcohol in the hall, and they didn't. I mean, I, I had, when I was a counselor, I had one incident where um, I knew she had brought some alcohol into the dining room, and I told her, you got 10 minutes to get it out. Um, and she didn't question it, she did it. Um, but it's not, you know, it, it just wasn't, um, people didn't really disobey the rules. Um, and, the, and the hours, um, um, having read the Dean's, the Dean's Bible, I know that it was Dean Schleeman who was working on trying to get rid of women's hours, but in, in many senses it, it was kind of a protection. Um, and I, I don't, most of us didn't question it. Um, also, men were not allowed on the floor except certain days that were designated as visitation days. Um, but that was all right too because um, you know when you went down to the to take a shower, you didn't have to be fully dressed, <laughs> you know, and so um, and you didn't have a problem with men staying overnight. That wasn't. It just wasn't done. That, and I don't, I don't remember that we questioned it. Um, there wasn't a lot of discussion about it. So, um, times changed. Yeah. <laughs> I was well, going to. Oh, well. No, I was going to say that uh, part of the philosophy was if you control the women, you control the men. <laughs> because, yeah. you know, after, after women's hours, the guys would go. Get pizza and beer or whatever. And yeah. we, we did have an occasional panty raid scare, but usually the panty raids ended up being um, we they serenaded rather than we couldn't get in. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so. <Yeah. laughs> but, uh, <coughs> I know. <clears throat> Sorry, I know that you work for housing services. Yeah, correct. Can you right. talk a little? Well, um, a, a year after, we came, we were gone for a year. I worked at Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis for a year, and he worked, um, he went back for his, um, um, well, we were married right, right after we graduated, a week after. Then <laughs> um, he worked for his father for a while and then worked for the electric company for, um, but um, when we came back, um, I was, um, hired as an assistant supervisor in Sheely Hall. And Sheely had just been reopened, the dining. There was um, dining service in every hall, mm -hmm. um, always cafeteria uh, and waiter style. So I worked in Sheely for a couple of years. Um, I remembered my first few days back, Sheely had just been remodeled and somebody, um, on the construction group had poured cement into the dish machine oh. 
and I spent several days chipping cement out of, out of the dish machine. I remember thinking, this is not what I went to college for. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, um, and so, and we had most of our um, help were girls that lived in the hall, and, and then we had boys, the guys that served. And usually the guys that served were um, in a fraternity, and they would, um, they served for free meals. So they got their dinner. Um, they got paid also, but not very much. But um, they worked mostly to, for meals because they weren't serving them in there. Or they could cut down on their fraternity cost or whatever, you know. Um, but we worked, we fed breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And so um, we worked what was considered a split shift. Um, although in actuality, what happened in the afternoon was when you spent your time um, ordering food. <laughs> so we, we could take off for an hour or so in the afternoon, but most of the time we didn't. Um, and we worked um, two weekends out of three. We would combine um, in the dining court or in the in Windsor, for example, um, coverage for the weekends, um, and mostly that was most of the meals on the weekends were fed in Warren and water. So we would work down there, but we would work um, one weekend. It would be Saturday with Sunday off, and one weekend it'd be both Saturday and Sunday, and the third weekend we'd have off. So we worked essentially two weekends out of three. Um, and um, because we worked in, in um, we got to be pretty good friends with the supervisors in the other halls that were um, around us. I remember a very funny thing that happened. We, if we would run out, we usually didn't run out of food because we knew a pretty close how many people were going to be there because you only fed the people in your hall except on weekends. Um, and uh, we had pretty good records of how much we needed and so forth. In fact, ordering was pretty simple. It was done on pink, white, and green sheets of paper <laughs> and um, was sent to food stores. Um, but um, one, we had um, a lot of special dinners for things like Mother's Day when we invited the mothers and then we'd have special dinners and we'd use tablecloths and um, candles and um, um, nice decorations, mm -hmm. uh, flowers on the table and so forth um, for special dinners and did it for our Christmas dinner and Thanksgiving and so forth. We had, um, and we also had dinner dances and that's another story. But anyway, one time on Mother's Day in the hall next to me, Wood, um, we, we all served the same menu. It was fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and gravy, and peas. Um, I don't remember what the salad and dessert were, but anyway, the, um, what happened in Wood that day was that um, the waiters came in with a tray full of food, and the tra they had several plates mm -hmm. on, a tr on a tray, and when they went through the door, the door hit the back of the tray and the plates all fell on the floor. Well, that was 12 dinners on the floor and you didn't have very many extras. So um, she, because every place was signed up, was full. And so um, she called around to the other halls and got some extra food and replaced those 12 trays. But the next waiter came through with um, a tray Full of gravy for each of the tables, and um, there was one pea on the floor. <laughs> oh. And he found it. Oh no! And the tray went with gravy all over the floor. Oh. <laughs> Lost all the gravy, so the other halls helped her get some more oh, gravy. No. And um, when they came back through with the replacement dinners, the floor was slick from gravy. Oh no! And they lost it again. Oh, <laughs> so anyway, we. It was dinner in the show that night. 
Right. I'm not sure what happened to, <laughs> to replace. 24 dinners was a lot to be lost. But anyway, and we may have had, had to go to X Hall to get the dinners. I'm not sure what happened. But anyway, it, in retrospect, it was funny. That night it wasn't. <laughs> but, so were you in charge of meal planning and nutritional things? Given your background? We, um, no, the food managers planned the menus. Okay. And that, that was done, um, we all had the same same menus. Um, but in each hall we ordered, um, we ordered the food. Um, but we were not involved in the, just the food managers okay. were planning. Now, I was, in Chile, I was a supervisor, in, or assistant supervisor actually. Um, and then I went to um, Meredith, no, f first to Earhart um, as the ordering supervisor. And it was a little different in Earhart because that was a larger hall. Mm -hmm. And um, we had two assistant supervisors and an ordering supervisor who did the ordering. And so I was there um, for a couple of years and then went to uh, Meredith X Hall as um, food manager, um, and then um, I we started our family, and so um, I took about fifteen years off and raised kids. How so many children do you have? We have three. Okay. We have a, a boy who lives in Meredith or in in Maryland, <laughs> um, and he has two children, and they've just spent a couple weeks with us. And we have a daughter in Las Vegas who has a baby, um, 10 month old. And then we have a son that lives here in Lafayette and he also has a son and daughter, so. Nice. So, yeah, nice family. And all doing well, fortunately. <laughs> well, we talked a little bit about um, living in the halls and there was no requirement to, to live in the residence halls, but the re residence halls have been, I mean, throughout the years, a very popular option. They still are today. A lot of students will, will opt to live in the halls all four years. Why do you think that is? Because they've always done a good job. Um, I think, um, yeah, Purdue residence halls have always been quality. They've always been well maintained. Um, we had a daughter that went to IU and um, I was shocked when I walked in the hall, it, opening day, it was not clean. Um, there were exposed light bulbs. There were, and you just, oh, the food the, um, in the dining room, there was lunch meat that was served on tables, not on cold areas, cold refrigerated areas. Um, I, I was just shocked at um, the difference in um, the two schools, I, 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 and I can't compare it to any other schools, but um, I think <clears throat> the residence halls have always had um, good food service, excellent food service, and have always maintained their facilities. Um, you could always be proud of them. What do you think, John? Well, I think she's probably right. Um, you know, um, when I lived in Cary Hall, the manager of Cary Hall was a guy by the name of Bob Hunt, Robert Hunt. Uh, he was uh, an ex-Navy guy, and he ran the hall like a ship. I mean, he was the captain. If something was wrong, he fixed it. Uh, and uh, the, the administration of the men's residence halls was always easy to work with. They were always willing to listen to you. Of course. Every student group makes unreasonable demands at some <laughs> point in their history, but um, they were a good uh, a good group. There was a there was an organization called Pendragon. I don't know if it still exists or not, but it was it consisted of all the presidents and all the managers. Uh, uh, Bob Page was the director of the men's residence halls. 
And uh, this group met at least once a month, and we would sit around and talk about the halls, and students were included. It wasn't, this is the way it is, and this is what we're going to do kind of thing. Um, and so I think the residence halls have always been somewhat responsive to students. It's a good value. It's certainly a good value. You know, uh, our oldest son said that he wanted, after his, I think his sophomore year maybe, said he wanted to move to an apartment to save money, and we laughed. <laughs> and, and it proved to be pretty much true. He did move to an apartment, but I don't think he saved money. Uh, but uh, at any rate, it's kind of like when you travel. There are certain restaurants that you know pretty much what you're going to get at that restaurant. You know whether it's going to be cheap, you know whether it's going to be good, uh, whatever. And I think the idea was that you were getting a product that you knew uh, that you knew about. Uh, I mean, if they serve people now roast beef, mashed potatoes, and green beans, about, a, I don't know what percentage, but probably pretty high, would say, oh, this is terrible stuff. <laughs> well, back then, that was great stuff. Uh, you know, uh, we were kids of the 40s and 50s, and our parents were from the 20s and 30s, and so... Uh, it was just handed down. It was like getting a job. There was never a question. You're going to get a job. As soon as you're old enough to work, you're going to get a job. And uh, we did that. But at any rate, it was, it was a good good experience. Met a lot of interesting people. Some of those people are still my friends, uh, even after 50 years. And... Um, I met a, I met a fellow in Florida. Uh, we were walking down the street, and Ann had on a Purdue jacket. And this guy stopped, and he said, "Did you go to Purdue?" And we talked, and I realized that this guy was one of the unit presidents when I was president <laughs> of Cary Hall. Uh, but uh, I have friends. In fact, I was with couple of guys on uh, Friday, wasn't it, that that I was in college with. Actually, we were all in the Reamer Club together. Uh, and so some of those friendships have endured all these years. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very, uh, very rewarding to think that People didn't forget you, and you didn't forget them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> At least, not yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we had a lot of fun when we lived in the halls. Oh I yeah, think, you know it was. You studied, you worked, because because you were at Purdue. You know, mm -hmm. it was not a it was not a goof off school. Well, you know, the president of Cary Hall had a suite of rooms, actually two rooms. I uh, had more like an office room and a and a uh, bedroom. bedroom, and uh, the year that I was president, they remodeled uh, Northwest Unit, where the president lived, and so I moved over to the top floor in C Unit. Uh, you know, there's a big dormer at the mm -hmm. front. There's a big room right up there. And a guy by the name of Bill Smith was my roommate. He was my roommate two years, still a good friend, uh, lives in Arizona, will be here for a football game this fall. But um, fourth floor in C unit had a lot of football players on it and mostly upperclassmen. And we kind of lived in our own little world up there. A guy by the name of Terry Brennan was the counselor. And Brennan was basically a guy that 
if you don't make too much noise and you don't disturb me, I don't care what you're doing up here. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we did um, we did make hard cider up there. <laughs> uh, we had a group we called the Unit C Premier Club, and what it boiled down to was there was a, a guy who was kind of small and wary and he could get into the room where they kept the film <laughs> he managed to get into the room where they kept the film because Carrie showed movies periodically well then we managed to get the movie and see it a day ahead of time up there packed our room mm -hmm. ate popcorn and cokes I don't I don't recall a point where there was much alcohol in the, in the hall, but there was some occasionally. And um, the guy who lived right next door to me was the projectionist for the for the uh, movie Carrie Carrie movie, mm -hmm. and he was offended by the fact that we, he knew we were doing this, <laughs> so he took the cinemascope lens out of the camera. So we watched the time machine and everybody looked like they were about four feet tall and about <laughs> that wide. Uh, but uh, further than that, we uh, actually kidnapped him and taped him to a chair and made him watch the movie with us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and I, he said, I'll never forget his words. He said, if you offend me, I'll turn you in. Well, we didn't care. <laughs> and so the fourth floor was a little a little undisciplined up there. Uh, had all these football players up there. Uh, there were occasional women visitors. At three or four o'clock in the morning, you might hear somebody going down the hall that, wasn't, that didn't live there. Uh, <laughs> uh, that never happened in our room, but... Uh, uh, I used to get up early in the morning. I still do. Smith did not like to get up early in the morning. <laughs> and so about the first day that we were roommates, I got up in the morning and I was singing some country song and he <laughs> rose from his bed and said, this will not happen again. <laughs> and so after that point, uh, when I'd get up in the morning, I'd study quietly. I did not, I did not so much as hum uh, uh, music. But uh, at any rate, it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I heard about a guy... Uh, when we were together on Friday, we were reminiscing about some of the people we knew, and there was a fellow by the name of Westerman who got a huge letter I, blew down off of a motel, something or other in, I've forgotten what it was, campus in or something, at any rate, filled it with water and had a fish oh. <laughs> swim back and forth in there. And then he got the idea, I'll just hook up a little battery with an electrode. Oh, and he, when the fish would get to a certain point, he'd do it. And after a while, that fish just swam. It would not go to the other end <laughs> of the thing. But that was probably kind of mean, and, and <laughs> Peter would get after him today. But uh, at any rate... Uh, we had, we had an awful lot of fun. We had one freshman that lived on the floor, and uh, but he was included in our group, and he was good natured. They kidded him about being a freshman and whatnot, but it was it was a very very pleasant time living in Cary Hall, very pleasant. Yeah. That's about everything that I have um, to ask. Okay. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? Um, 
not to my know of. I mean, we had, you know, it was, I, I think it was an easier time in a lot of ways. And, uh, um, I, I don't know that the academics were any easier, but, um, you know, it was, we had a lot of fun living, made good friends. and, and uh, You didn't I, have to go to class. Notes weren't online. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah. You a know. couple of a couple of things that um, that I was involved with that you know wouldn't happen today was um, I was um, dean for a day. Oh. And that was a program that was very short lived <laughs> um, because it was voted on by the f student body, student women, um, and. Um, because the residence halls had a pretty large vote, there were very few Greek women. And so right. it was a program that was discontinued, <laughs> probably for that reason. Um, there were um, honoraries that are still, some of them still in existence, but one that isn't is gold peppers. Um, and I think that was pretty much Greek, um, but I don't know what happened to that organization. Um, Tomahawk was um, an activity-oriented honorary, um, and I, I think now they have the option of um, choosing to be in some of those honoraries, mm -hmm. where at that time they were, you were chosen. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, um, anyway, it it was a pleasant time, I think, to be on campus. So, yeah, I, I would I would agree with that. Uh, the same was true of the Reamer Club. I mean, you had to be invited to be a member, and uh, now they just sign up. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, there were no women in the Reamer Club at that time. And a guy who lives here actually was in the Reamer Club in the 50s. I was in the 60s. And he told me that he used to have the Reamers come out to his farm and they'd have a, a campfire and visit and that sort of thing. And he said it all ended when, uh, when women came into the Reamer Club and they're having the campfire and the women are passing around a bottle of whiskey and drinking. And he said, I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> and I mean, things have changed. You never heard people talk the way they do. Even our grandchildren say things that we would never have said when we were kids. If you did, why well, you got knocked on your tail. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I mean. It was a more polite time. Yeah. But corporal punishment was in existence, especially from your parents. And if you grew up in a small town, uh, nobody, nobody was above correcting you if you did something you shouldn't have done. And I mean, they, you know, you didn't hit somebody else's kid, but. Um, when you got home, your parents might hit you for it. <laughs> <laughs> your parents probably knew before you got home. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. A lot of us got our seats warmed for things we probably shouldn't have done. But I don't, at the college level, um, parents were really not involved. We didn't. Yeah, that's right. I don't think we had what they call helicopter parents yeah. now. I don't. That didn't. No, you were pretty. If much, you were in trouble, you were in trouble yourself. You, you, know? you were your on parents your own. were not called. You were on your own. <laughs> um, although grades were sent home, um, and um, bills were sent home. I mean, they weren't. You know, I know that that's not the policy now. But parents were involved, but not. Well, we didn't have emails. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there was no social media. <laughs> right, right. 
Well, thank you for letting me come and, and visit mm -hmm. with you today. I think it's, it's wonderful to get a perspective of people that have lived in the halls and then also worked in the halls as well. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah.